For more about uh, these meetings and the world economy, William Lee joins us, chief economist at the Milken Institute. Um, good to see you again, William. Look, if I fell asleep three years ago and just woke up today, I, I would be a little depressed. I mean, it feels like the world's coming to an end from the World Bank and IMF officials. And I, I don't want to, I'm not downplaying the seriousness of situations, but I look at it as glass half full, that in spite of these challenges, we are here today doing the good work of the economy. I, I don't know if you see it that way, but I, I'll get your takeaway on what you thought um, and how these meetings went. There's an overwhelming sense of sadness that after the world was hit with COVID, we tried to unite to fight COVID. Uh, we have regional war in Russia and Ukraine. I, again, the world has tried to get together, try to pr uh, bring peace to that kind of re resolution, to that conflict, and the oil shocks that have hit, all the supply chain issues, all of these issues, we, we have kind of pulled the world together and said, we got to work together to, to make things better. And yet the IMF meetings couldn't come out with a unified framework, an agreed set of policies. All the IMF said was, yeah, we got to get rid of inflation and you got to have central banks raise rates. But on the other hand, raising rates is making the poor countries worse off, so you got to not raise rates so much. The IMF and World Bank are speaking out of both sides of their mouths. You, you saw earlier in the picture where we had the IMF uh, chief and along with um, the, the Spanish, I believe, um, first prime minister or deputy prime minister talking about how they were hoping to get a unified statement released by the yeah. end of the session, but they did not. What do you think was the reason that they could not reach an agreement? Individual countries are facing very different problems. The inflation problem alone is very different in Europe because it's mainly supply side and energy oriented, whereas in, in the United States, it's much more demand oriented because of excess fiscal spending. And so we can't agree on a policy to get rid of inflation that's true for the whole world. And it's all that IMF can say is, do what you gotta do. But when you gotta do what you gotta do, make sure you don't kill off the, the, the poorer, poorer emerging market economies. As I said, it's very hard to get an agreement when the world is torn apart with very fragmented kind of problems. And globalization part two is regionalizing the world much more so than before. Globalization is not the way it was two years ago. There was a time, William, when we often debated about there isn't enough inflation and we were worried about deflation. I mean, look what Japan went through for you know over a decade where prices were flat to, to lower and companies could not raise prices. Yeah. Today, yes, we have inflation, but this, this is not going to end the world as we see it. And plus, by the way, inflation has come down. So for the regular person who watches our show, and looks at the world economy and looks at their checkbook, explain to me why inflation is such a terrible thing, because I, I just don't see it that way. The, the hurtfulness of inflation comes with its persistence. If it comes and, and, and just stays with us at a pace that is higher than wage increases, then the checkbook that the check that we get every week starts to buy fewer and fewer things. That's the cancerous decay that inflation brings. And that's why central banks are so determined to bring it down to 2%, which is a more reasonable rate, and also below where wage increases are going and where productivity is pushing up wages. That's why it's so important for the man in the street to say, yeah, we got to get rid of inflation. But are you going to get rid of inflation by throwing me out of a job? Are you going to throw me out of a job and all well, my neighbors out of a job? That, that's my point. What's wrong with buying less things? It's like, on one hand, you want people to buy more things, but we are asking people to buy less things by raising, you know, it, it just seems to me you're not going to have it both ways. Either you have a hot economy where there is inflation and, and things are rocking and rolling, or you have a slow economy where things are kind of sad and yeah, there's inflation, and then you can afford, I guess, a little bit less, but you'll be buying less. The Fed and all the central banks in the world cannot have it both ways. The fear is that the inflation that we have now, which is only at about 5 or 6%, will become what Argentina has, which grows to 100%. And that's when people say, I can't trust our own currency anymore. I want dollars. I don't want the peso anymore. That's where the world starts to fall apart. Getting from here to there is a long way, but it's not that far away. And the central banks got to start now to make sure that we don't get inflation running off into the Argentinian hyperinflation. Those are the fears that all economists are afraid of. I felt we had some fairly positive momentum. I mean, on the U.S. side, we talked about increasing the, um, 
the EPA standards for vehicles. I know we're going to make a push for electric vehicles, but even for uh, gas and, elect uh, and gasoline vehicles, we're increasing the requirements uh, that are needed over the next decade. The IMF and World Bank meetings, they also discuss climate change as an issue. It seems to me that while we, we may not be united in the way we deal with climate change, each country is doing their part, be it the U.S. or China or, or countries in Europe. Everyone has their own strategy on how to handle it. It doesn't have, we don't all have to do exactly the same thing, right? Absolutely. And in fact, one size fits all does not fit. China, for example, can cut back on its coal and really have its emissions, carbon emissions. But by doing so, it, does, it gets rid of half of its energy sources. That's just not practical. So again, getting people to re recognize the policies that they need in their own countries to get climate change under control is something that the IMF and World Bank have got to recognize and cannot impose standards for every country around the world. I will take that as a small positive. William, always good to see you, my friend. Thanks for having me. All right.